While you may have moved on from your joyous youth and are now stuck with a full-time job, wife, and multiple failed YouTube channels, you can still escape back to your favorite childhood media. And more than likely, the company known as Disney may be one of the most significant parts of that nostalgia. But what if I told you that the old Disney magic was built upon a history of theft, propaganda, and ruthless bloodshed? Well, get ready, inquisitive humans, because we're about to learn about some of Disney's most wicked ways on today's episode of Comedic Matters. What's even funnier, I just prepared for this yesterday and my guests have no clue what's about to happen. <laughs> Hello, everybody, and welcome to Comedic Matters, the podcast where my friends and I learn a little bit about weird topics, ponder life's most interesting questions, and definitively answer them without any qualifications to do so. So strap yourselves in, keep your arms and legs inside the ride at all times, and prepare yourself for the Comedic Matters podcast. On today's show, we have two familiar faces, the weekend weed whacker, Cracker Brian, and our second guest, the gonadorific Ben. On today's episode, we have another important question. You might be able to figure out what it is from this image. We're finally answering once and for all. We're solving the mystery. Is Disney evil? Now, we're not going to get to the definition of evil to the very end. So I will I will give you that. But first, we've got to talk about Disney. All right. Are we going to get a definition of Disney at the beginning? Yes, we are, Brian. Just in case okay. you didn't know what it was. I'm going to be talking about Disney. All right. Britannica says, it's now one of the world's largest media conglomerates. I study media a lot. Um, and it's been buying up competing companies. It's buying up competing land. So it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger. It's like a blob. They made a great deal of our childhood. I don't know about you guys, but I still have a lot of those songs stuck in my head. Uh, Under the Sea. Under that, that's another. I love that every time it pops up. Books, movies, TV shows that had a whole TV network, got a whole theme park on two different sides of the country. What's what's some of your favorite Disney stuff, guys? I I partake in all of the above. All I of mean, them? Did 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 not not did. now. Yep, That's I do silly. notice the tents. Yep. I, can I can I confirm one thing before we keep get into this? Absolutely, yes. Is there a point where you are going to break into song and dance? I will show. No, never. I'm not. Okay. I'm not allowed to do that. Not again. Maybe, maybe a song about baked goods. No. Okay. You two could. I mean, you had all of thirty seconds or a minute to prepare for this. True. Sorry. Yeah. So well, go ahead and scheme. Go ahead and scheme. Do you remember the choreo from that thing we did that time? Remember that, Ben? I don't know what he's talking about. <laughs> all right. Okay. You know, it didn't start off as Mickey Mouse, right? It started off as something else. Ben, you might know it from. Epic Mickey 2, perhaps one of the best video games ever made. Anyway, started off as Oswald the Lucky Rabbit. Then you get Steamboat Willie, which is the most important one, 1928, the first Mickey cartoon released with, you know, some audio. So that's all you need to know. Starts off as a rabbit, turns into a mouse, seems innocent, family-friendly entertainment. But we want to get to the dark sides now. So this is not a fair episode that just says, here's five reasons why it's bad, here's five reasons why it's good. No, this is all dirty things I've read. These are some of the worst things. And we just need to decide, are these bad things enough to classify them as evil? All right. Reason number one, we all may be able to relate to this one. Disney ruins the concept of love. Okay. Hmm. Disney movies, when you watch them, when you grow up watching princesses immediately falling into love, Prince Charming's, It ruins love. So let me read this to you and then I'll get your reaction. This is from Thrive Global. The truth is love and fulfilling relationships aren't guaranteed of the human experience. You have to work at them. You have to get at them. And once you're in them, you have to continue to work at them. It's not this instant perfect thing. But if you watch Disney movies, and I just assembled a couple of them, couple of them, we assume You'll know love at first sight. You'll immediately fall in love. Nobody ever gets cancer and then happily ever after, right? So a couple of examples. Cinderella goes to a ball, falls in love at first sight, runs away from her obligations, and then is spontaneously rescued by a dude who has the same foot size or has the right slipper size, right? Uh, You've got 
what else, what else did I find? Snow White falls asleep, surrounded by a bunch of dwarves for a long time. Her Prince Charming literally stumbles upon her, kisses her, and they're immediately perfect. Ariel from The Little Mermaid goes up onto land, is found naked by the prince. They immediately fall in love, happily ever after. But anyway, I actually found a study. I don't want to go too much into it, but this is from Brittany Minor, and she gave a survey out to women aged 20 to 37. She asked them essentially, how many Disney movies did you watch growing up? And then their take on romantic partners. And guess what? It had a significant impact on how they choose mates, what they expect out of their mates, their standards of love. And if the relationship isn't perfect, they'll blame it on the dude or the partner because it's not as good as the Disney movie. Now, I don't know about you two, but I spent a lot of time on dating websites, and I can back this up. I can see, I saw so many people saying, I'm looking for a Prince Charming to sweep me off my feet. You gotta be this tall. You gotta have this shoe size. Like, they had specific demands, and I feel like I could see this happening. Expecting people to treat them like the princess that they are, or whatever. Yes, yes. It's always the man that has to do the pursuing, that kind of thing. is very, very archaic Yep, and perpetuated by Disney. Sorry, they're, they're slowly changing their image with like the whole Frozen and her being like a strong female that doesn't need a yes. male counterpart. Yep. So they are trying to fix it, but I think they've done so much damage and they're <laughs> still tr- shoving those classics down our throat out of their special vault every so often. Oh, just- ben, ben knows the next one. Also, that meatball and that spaghetti looks disgusting. I don't know about you guys, but it looks yeah. like there's no sauce on it. It, At it, first, looks, it looks like spaghetti ooze to me. <laughs> and what's with the, bad thing. The, the, the three bloody breadsticks? They look like they're covered oh, in fire ants yeah. or something. Yeah. That's weird. Fire ant breadsticks. They never get eaten. They're dogs. I mean, and they're not touching those things. They must be gross. I mean, they're eating in an alleyway, probably next to a dumpster. Yep. So you, you can only expect so much. That's I mean, true. You can see the, the rain gutter in the background there. That's true. A loaf of bread next to the breadsticks looks nice, though. Also, Weird. Italians, I love your food, but it's all carb-based, right? It's like you got mm-hmm. breadsticks, you got bread, you got the noodles. What's wrong? Perfect. <laughs> anyway, Perfect. all right. That's reason number one. Just wanted to start things off with something a little, little sweeter. Love. Love being ruined. Okay. Ben, you mentioned the next one, the vault strategy. This one really ticks me off. It grinds my gears. This is according to Time Magazine. And we might remember this. It's a little different with how streaming things are now. But if you wanted to buy a certain movie at a certain year when Disney would put it away into its vault, you couldn't get it. And this vault strategy involves putting away media shows, media films to where sometimes you couldn't buy it for seven to 10 years or more because Disney didn't want to promote that thing at that time. So it's a company intentionally not selling all of their products and putting them away. There's no reason. There's no scarcity. There's no compelling argument other than what this person's about to say from the Wall Street Journal. It's a marketing technique engineering not interest, but engineering fear. I feel like this concept, though, was developed before the internet and eBay existed because... I feel like any more since eBay, there's they had to have been losing money doing this because all of their their products would have been sold secondhand through eBay and they wouldn't have seen any of those profits. Just reminds me of like uh, when McDonald's brings out the McRib. Absolutely, Ben. Yep, yep. Well, that's a whole other thing. We'll have to do it. And it is McDonald's evil? <laughs> I've read that it, it, they only do it when the price of pork goes on to a certain level so they can profit from it, and then they release gotcha. it. And then they use that tactic too. Don't miss out. Mm-hmm. It's the whole pumpkin spice limited. Yeah, there's companies do it a lot. Mm-hmm. So you're telling me that mm-hmm. if I want to be making good profits, that's how I need to run my OnlyFans account? Yes, Brian. You have to say, this picture of my balls is only available for one month. Maybe save it for like the end of No Nut November or something. Do I call it a <laughs> perk? By the way, this is a, this is random, but could you imagine somebody interpreting that literally and like chopping off their balls and they go to their friends, <laughs> oh yeah, I'm participating in No Not November and like, look, and then like his friends are horrified, like Bob, you made a mistake. <laughs> I just put him back on, super glue. Yep, glue him back on, I think that works. Anyway, fear of missing out, the vault. So this this limited scarcity thing 
actually goes back to tests done on lab rats. So Disney is using the same logic as this. The old behaviorists found that if a lab rat knew it would get a pellet every time it hit a lever, the rat would take his time with the food and collect it only when he wanted it. But when the researchers didn't allow the lever to release the food or the lever could only release the food during certain times, that poor anxious lab rat would develop a a state of FOMO and when it pulled the lever, it would just shovel food into its mouth because it knew it was limited. So we're all just lab rats, guys, which is interesting because Disney is also a mouse. This one kind of connects to what Ben said again. Maybe Ben knows this episode perfectly. So the evil reason number three, propaganda saved Disney. This is not a conspiracy. This is legit. So in 1941, even though Oswald was successful and Steamboat Willie was successful, a couple years later, they run into financial woe because Disney, Walt Disney, he goes all in. He's like, I'm going to make this musical, this epic musical. It's going to change the history of motion pictures. And it actually almost bankrupted the studio because it didn't do as well as how much money he put into it. One of the reasons why it failed was it used a revolutionary sound system called Fantasound that every theater would have to re-update itself. It would have to install new speakers and put new stuff in. So, of course, theaters said, we're not doing this for one movie. Even though we like it, we can't afford this. So that didn't do well. And then it released another film afterwards to try to save itself called Pinocchio. That didn't do well. So that lost money too, kind of bombs in a row even though they're beloved now didn't do well so what do they do to get out of it they were contracted by the government to make dozens of propaganda films for them so again this is all documented so we're going to walk through a couple of the big ones that really shocked me here's donald i do i do remember donald in remember this remember this all right yeah this one actually comes from 19 1942 this one's called the new spirit and again they released i think it was 42 of these things So 42 contracted films. I'll get to the number in a little bit. I just prepared for this yesterday. Remember, folks. But anyway, the first one was called A New Spirit. Disney worked with the U.S. Department of Treasury on this one. And the overall goal of this was to encourage citizens to pay their taxes to support the war effort. This is the released goal. And if you think that this kind of thing has stopped, it hasn't. You can find that, like, in order to use battleships, you have to submit your scripts to this wing of the government for them to allow you to use them. So this stuff still happens, but this one was pretty overt. Donald um, has this patriotic spirit throughout. He has to enter World War II. He's dancing to patriotic songs. Uh, A radio announcer tells him that if you have the patriotic spirit, you have to do your part and pay your taxes. And it literally turns into this thing where it looks like Donald's like experiencing this fever dream or tripping where his eyes are wide open. And it's like taxes make the world go round. Taxes fund the war effort. Taxers fight the Nazis. Like if you go back and watch this, it's hilarious in retrospect, but it's scary that a child company works with the government to get you to pay your taxes. Pretty creepy, guys. You ever see this hey. one? You remember, you remember this? Mm-hmm. How many kids watching Donald Duck have taxes to pay? Well, exactly. But they're using this figure to get the adults to right. pay your taxes. So yes. it's, it's maybe coercing the kids to pressure their parents to yep. do more of this yep. crap. Okay. So, Ben, you have a kid, right? You're probably dragged to a lot of things yeah. you don't necessarily have interest in. So if you're getting snuck in that propaganda... You're probably like, yes, taxes will make my daughter safe. Taxes, taxes, right? Interesting. Yeah, I don't think there's a lot of taxes being discussed or displayed on like Disney on Ice nowadays. Yeah, but yeah, I'm sure there's other stuff. Yeah, well, now we can just you know put you in jail, right? There's it's a little easier to track people. But anyway, yeah. I wanted to start off with a little more innocent one. So taxes. All right, this one. What? When was Donald a Nazi? <laughs> Hold on a second. <laughs> At knife point, or bayonetta point. Oh, yeah, that's clearly the Allies getting rid of them. All right, here we go. This one was called Der Fuhrer's Face. Remember that old Spike Jones song, right in the Fuhrer's Face? It's an old Dr. Demento kind of silly comedy song. Well, they have that same title for this one. This one pushes war bonds. According to Investopedia, I wanted to look up what a war bond was because I'd always heard it, so I figured why not educate the people? 
A war bond is essentially a debt instrument issued by a government where a citizen can give money to the government and the money borrows it and you don't make like a profit on it. So it's you essentially loaning your money to the government where you could put it into something else like a stock and you could get money back on it. You're basically loaning the government money so that it can blow up more people. And this is what it was pushed in this cartoon. It was really pushed in a lot of stuff back then, but Disney really helped sell this in this 1943 cartoon. Let me give you a little summary and then you can react just a little bit. The cartoon features Donald Duck in a nighttime setting working at a factory in Nazi Germany where they're pushing war bonds and it's an example of propaganda World War II. Yes, Donald Duck is a Nazi and this is the first or this is the game we call Is Matt Lying? Did Disney really make a cartoon where Donald Duck played a Nazi or is this a joke? What do you think? Is Matt lying? I'm going to take a drink. Guys, is Matt lying? I feel Ooh. like I've, I've seen Donald enough to know that he was supposedly a war hero. Like whenever he talks to all his nephews and in, in like more newer things, it's strange to think that he would have been a Nazi and and on the, the allied side of the war. So I'm going to have to go lying. I think he was just in costume. Okay. Ben? My theory might be that he starts off as a Nazi in the cartoon, but gets uh, rehabilitated or converts or, yeah, somehow has a change of heart, maybe. So I'll say he's, Matt is telling the truth. Okay. So you're both kind of in different areas, right? Mm hmm. Ben? Oops. Uh -oh. Ben, you first. You are correct. All right. Oh. I'm telling the truth. He does play a Nazi, but you'll you'll find out that there are reasons for it. Brian, I don't remember what you said, but you're wrong. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so because of wartime rationing, Donald's breakfast consists of bread that is so stale and hard that it resembles wood. His coffee is brewed from a single hoarded coffee bean. And the bacon and egg are like a flavored breath spray. So even though Donald is a Nazi, it's making fun of the Nazis, right? So it's trying to, it's, it's clearly propaganda that's anti-Nazi. Now, I'm not saying that I'm pro-Nazi. I'm anti-propaganda, though. So I don't, I don't like brainwashing in any sense. Uh, it keeps going sillier and sillier. He gets forced in front of a band. Um, he's reading Mein Kampf. The, mar the marching band keeps pushing him through his house, and then it reveals that it was a hallucination. So he wasn't really there, but it, he did for a moment look like he was a Nazi. Disney yeah. clearly doesn't like this one anymore, right? Could you imagine this showing up before a movie, Ben, before Encanto or before the next Disney up <laughs> sequel they make? Mm -hmm. No. So he, he reveals can, that it was, it was like a fever dream. Then he sees the Statue of Liberty. And again, there's another kind of fever dreamy moment where he's like clearly clockwork orange style being brainwashed. So he sees the Statue of Liberty and he says, I, uh, I'm glad to be a citizen of the United States of America. Uh, there's one more. I want one more. And this one is not an Is Matt Lying. This is perhaps the most disturbing one called Education for Death in 1943. This took a much more serious tone. And instead of Donald playing a Nazi, it showed you like a little kid in Germany being brainwashed into Nazism. It said, there's no seed of laughter, no hope, no tolerance, no mercy. It showed a little kid being brainwashed, doing the Zig Heil, right? Worshipping Adolf. And the reason why... Really? Go ahead. Clearly only one of them is a true Nazi. I mean, look at those other ones. Not blonde they haired, didn't... not blue eyed. Get rid of those ones. <laughs> That's the, that's the message, right? If you're not this perfect Aryan race, you go to hell. You're, you're going to be killed. And the reason why I think this one, if you go back and watch this, it's terrifying to think that they were showing this to little kids and this brainwashed you into thinking that a whole country was in support of this. Like, imagine if another country, somebody in France, looked at how warmongery the United States is, and they assume that everybody is a Cheeto eating foam finger waving, you know, you can't do that. It's, it's awful. And rarely does our country ever look in a mirror. Think about how brainwashy we are. You guys remember doing the pledge of allegiance? I got in trouble as a little kid. Cause I said, I'm not doing it anymore. This creeps me out. 
and I don't necessarily believe in a God. So I got in trouble for not participating in the brainwashing. You remember that stuff? Hmm. Mm -hmm. It's creepy. I <laughs> pledge allegiance under God to a country. Anyway, they made 32 of these. I was wrong. I said 42. I was thinking Douglas Adams, 32 of these. You can find some of them on YouTube and they're all equally creepy. Let's go from Nazism to copyright. Is, is the definition for copyright literally right in the word where it's the right to copy this? Well, sort of, Brian. So at you as the creator have the right to copy it and do whatever you want with it, but nobody else can. Let me walk you through this. Disney has actually had a tremendous impact on copyright law in the United States. And it's gone through many revisions. So when it first starts in 1790, it says, we want to give people who are creative types or creating patents or things that they should have the right to profit from that for a certain amount of time, right? That you shouldn't just release something and that anybody else could copy it or profit from it. It starts off as 14 years. They only wanted you to have 14 years of profit because back then they thought, it didn't have anything to do with how long you live, but it was, well, 14 years is enough to profit from something and then it should go to the public. Like it should, if you create a vaccine or if you create a movie, you should profit from it for 14 years, but then it should go to the public so we can treasure it, so we can put it in our own vault so everyone has a copy of it so that you don't get too greedy with it. It, it, get, it gets extended a little bit without Disney, but then Disney... Um, it starts to lobby Congress and the Senate because Steamboat w Willie is, is about to go out of the copyright. So it's about to get out of the area they can profit from it in 1984. So again, it's extended a couple of times, but Disney, Steamboat Willie, was supposed to enter the public domain, and Mickey Mouse is a character of the public domain, in 1984. Disney does not want this to happen. So Disney throws a ton of money at our corrupt politicians, and guess what happens? Guess what happens, guys? Copyright gets extended. Rich. It gets extended. Brian, what'd you say? I said that uh, they become rich is what would typically oh, happen. The politicians, when you get money yes, at you. the politicians yeah. become tremendously wealthy, and then it extends. So under the old provisions, the protection of Steamboat Willie should have expired in 1984 and the whole character, the whole mascot should have been in the public domain. So Brian, if you wanted to sell a t-shirt with Mickey uh, getting beheaded, you should have been able to do that in 1984. But we all clearly know that didn't happen. So because of lobbyists, because of this, because of a lot of this happening, the mm -hmm. hush, hush, nudge, nudge, the Copyright Act of 1976 is passed. So Disney knows that it's coming up in 1984. So in 1976, it gets this passed. And the revision goes from being able to profit from something for 14 years to the author's whole life plus 50 years after that. That's what hundreds of millions of dollars bought them. You can profit from something for your entire life and then pass that off to somebody else and they get 50 more years of it. Or there's a special rule for corporations 75 years after the author's life. So corporations really benefit even more than the everyday person. Now, but there will be a time unless they continue to shove more money into the hands of politicians when <laughs> Mickey will become available. But wait, there's more, Brian. Okay, but wait, there's oh. more. So if you do oh, the boy. math there, Mickey Mouse should have, if you do the math, should have expired again in 2003. All right? Just because of when Steamboat Willie came out, when the certain... So 2003, guess what? We're beyond 2003, right? As that deadline approached, Disney threw even more money. And in 1998, Congress adopted the Copyright Term Extension Act, also known, known as the Sonny Bono Copyright Act. When Sonny Bono, the Sonny and Cher guy was alive, he was a senator. He's the one who got bribed the most, apparently. And boom, this pops up. Detractors called it the Mickey Mouse Protection Act because it's clearly just Disney throwing money at people. Guess what this one did? The author's lifetime plus 70 years. So you get that or for corporations, 95 years. So corporations get a whole nother 20 added to it. Disney is just essentially every time it's coming up, throw money at it. So guess what? If you do the math this time, 
Steamboat Willie really should uh, be expiring yeah. in 2023. So copyright stops people from using the image itself. Or the idea of a character, the 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 names Main of profit. the characters. So, so you could, I, I could paint my face like Mickey Mouse, but not charge people money to see me like that, and that'd be okay. Not necessarily. So profit isn't necessarily... If you're like ruining the company's company's image or you're taking away sales of them somehow, like if people are coming to see you instead of paying for their products, they could make that argument and sue your ass off or your face off. My my follow up to this is, have you ever been to New York City and have you ever seen the creepy Mickeys that wander the streets? Yep. Yep. How how are they not off? You could argue, sorry, I did the click there. You could argue that that is like a criticism of Disney and that falls under like fair use. So you're criticizing Mickey's evil ways. You're changing it enough, you know, that could be a criticism or they just didn't get caught. That's, that's the only reason why. All right. This is reason number five. Think about all these stories that we grew up with, you know, Huck Finn, Snow White, Disney stole these from the public domain. So these were folk stories and old tales that already existed as free things that anybody could use. Disney takes them, gets their own copyright on them and extends it forever. So I have, I have a couple of examples of that. Huck Finn was taken from a Mark Twain book. Aladdin is from a folk tale called 1001 Nights. Alice in Wonderland is based on a Lewis Carroll book. Atlantis is from like Plato's story. The list goes on and on. Beauty and the Beast, Bugs Life, Cinderella. These are all things that were either folklore or tales. Robin Hood, Snow White, Sleeping Beauty, Tarzan, The Jungle Book, Three Musketeers. We could do a 14-hour podcast on all the things that Disney took from the public domain that were free and then profited from them and then could sue you if you tried to go back and use those things in the public domain. Taking free stuff, making it your own, and then preventing people from using it. And this is kind of a sub reason for it. Disney's also been involved in a lot of lawsuits. It's like there's a Japanese story about a white lion called Kimba. And this existed, I think a decade before the Lion King did. And people actually working on the movie, they thought that it was an adaptation of this story with Kimba in it because it was so similar. And in some of the early press, they talked about how it was an adaptation, but At some point during the production process, they change it and they don't acknowledge it anymore. And this company sued and lost because Disney has really good lawyers. Another one is Frozen. Um, People at Pixar were in the same festival as this animator Kelly Wilson in 2011. They both were there. And this Kelly person, Kelly Wilson, had a short film about a snowman. It sung songs. It did similar stuff to the movie Frozen. And people in the audience, there were literal Pixar people, 2011, and then surprise, surprise, Frozen comes out years later. Now, this one was so overt and direct that Disney actually agreed to settle this one out of court. You know what that usually means, right? We don't want this to get out. Paying them off to shut up. Yeah, shut up. We'll give you $100 million if you shut up. Some people do it just to not ruin their name. You know, there doesn't necessarily imply guiltiness. But it often is done if you're guilty. I heard some other uh, theories revolving around the fact that they named that movie Frozen. Yes, I heard that too, Ben. Go ahead. Go ahead. And that they, it was to kind of detract from the whole theory that Walt Disney had his head frozen or his body frozen after he died. Mm -hmm. So now when you Google Disney frozen frozen volumes and volume pages and pages of just yep the animated show animated movie and all the spin-offs he, and shorts and stuff is he frozen simply for the copyright because it's <laughs> after his life so if he's still alive <laughs> unfortunately brian being frozen doesn't work that way it's sad you're we haven't quite gotten it down yet to where you're still alive you're dead what if i had a character and i called it mookie moose yep would that be okay? If it was clearly a parody, you would probably be, probably be okay. But if it was serious and going after kids, you would probably not be okay. Disney would come after you. Mookie so Moose. Going after kids, like Mookie Moose attacks children? Yeah, and then that would clearly be a parody, right? You're making fun of Mickey Mouse. But if you have him talking a high-pitched voice, like he's been castrated and he's wa- walking around with mops, you're going to get sued. All right. Oh, no, he's got a, he's got a very deep voice. 
Mookie Moose is here for you kids. Come ride me. <laughs> I'm experiencing No Nut November. <laughs> God, this is horrifying. Let's talk about something else that's horrifying. Reason number six. We talked about how eBay may have popped up to prevent the vault, stru- uh, the vault strategy from really screwing you. But now mm-hmm. we got to talk about Disney is buying everything. And it started back in the 50s. Any competitor that would pop up, Disney would buy it. When it was trying to buy land, it would buy your house for the Disney worlds. Any realtor company that pop up, they'd buy that. Golf courses, media institutions, streaming platforms. They bought Pixar. They bought the Jim Henson company. You know, they bought that. So they own the Muppets. They own Marvel now. The biggest one is 21st Century Fox. Now, when I was growing up, we were taught about how 12 media companies owned all the media, like newspapers, radio, everything you get your information from, there were 12. Now there's down to six. And after this merger, you could argue it's almost five. So it's just bigger and bigger companies getting bigger and bigger. And Disney is the worst offender with this one, especially one of the biggest deals, one of the hugest $52.4 billion to buy 21st century Fox. And you might think, well, that's just one thing. What that means is They bought every film that Fox ever owned, every TV show that Fox ever made. It bought part of Hulu in this deal. So these companies, when you're buying one thing, you're getting hundreds of other companies. So think about everything that ever aired on Fox, the Simpsons, Family Guys, X-Files, Married with Children, all that raunchy stuff that happened in the 80s, Indiana Jones, Young Frankenstein, High Anxiety, it owns Mel Brooks stuff, Titanic. I went through the list, Avatar. It is crazy what Disney owns these days. It was a massive purchase. It owns everything. I looked even further, Indiana Jones, Star Wars, like I said, it's hard to imagine that we're not headed to a universe where basically Disney's gonna own everything. Home Alone, X-Men, Alien, Predator, Planet of the Apes, Ice Age, Firefly, Chronicles of Narnia, remember those zombie movies 28 days slash weeks later? It owns those, Peanuts, Garfield, Assassin's Creed movies, Porky's, that raunchy movie from the 80s, it owns that, Revenge of the Nerds, The Fly, Hot Shots, I loved Hot Shots, Speed, it's It's a massive list. Sure, they're buying these old things and you might go, well, okay, but they're they're a big company, they're going to help keep them alive, they're going to release them. But think about what we just talked about with the vault strategy. They're gonna now, they're now putting all those things into vaults. You can't buy those things like you once could. So when you have a hundred years of movies that we all grew up with and loved, when they put that in the vault strategy or they only put it on Disney Plus, which is my, they never came out and said this, but I think that's why they did it, right? They're gonna come up with the streaming platform. They're gonna lock every single movie we grew up with behind that paywall so that everyone's forced to subscribe to Disney Plus. That's Matt's theory. That's Matt's theory, right? But which is a, Which is a terrible streaming platform. I don't know if you've used it or not. I've but used it's, it. It's terrible. The mechanics of it are not as streamlined as like, say, Netflix or Hulu. They're not yet. They're not. They're not. Mm. No. Well, I I assume they're going to make like a Disney plus plus. Oh, yeah. Yep. It just it kills me, though, that they they are this media giant and they can't make a performing piece of software. The other cynical option would be right. So you release something that's broken at first. And then when you do an update, every time you do an update, it becomes like a new press release. We added this new thing and then you get more and more promotion. The diehards are going to use it and love it anyway. There's one more danger to this and it's actually a whole nother reason. So think about this. Now that they own essentially everything, if they were just releasing them whenever, so you could buy them whenever you wanted to, it'd be fine. But they're actually now censoring that old content. They are applying Disney standards to what we grew up with to prevent you from being able to get it the original way. I have a couple of examples. Stark Raving Dad, it's a classic episode from The Simpsons. I think it's from season three or something. And it's where Michael Jackson voices a character of uh, a mental patient where when Homer is thrown into an insane asylum called Stark Raving Dad. And this was pulled from broadcast because of that leaving Neverland doc that came out, you know, 
that kind of revealed Michael Jackson's potential child stuff, even though that's always been an allegation against him ever since I was a little kid. I can remember that. Disney then pulls it so you can't get this episode on Disney+. Plus. They will stop selling the box set so you can't buy it. So again, unless you go back to the old eBay option, you can't get this episode anymore. It's an entire episode taken away. Mm -hmm. You remember Splash, the movie? It's got Tom Hanks, John Candy. It was a good 80s movie. Uh, Tom Hanks, it was like the, almost like a live action version of Little Mermaid, right? Where Tom Hanks falls in love with a mermaid. Pretty much. Well, Disney is going back and they're changing this movie. If you look at the top part, that was the original where when Daryl Hannah was running away back into the ocean, you could see a little bit of her butt cheeks. Disney has spent millions of dollars to go in and add very awfully done digital hair to hide her butt. This seems like a joke. I thought this was an onion article. They clipped it and pasted it. They, oh yeah. yeah. It looks like an awful job. Absolutely. When you watch this in movement again, I couldn't play it. Disney would probably flag us. It looks just that bad. It's awful. It's awful. Toy Story 2, I don't know if you remember this, but they would do like end credit jokes, a lot of like end credit jokes. And there was one with Stinky Pete, the prospector, where he's in this box with the Barbies. And they they do this kind of casting couch joke where Stinky Pete goes, uh, if you stick around long enough in this box with me, I'll get you a good film role. Which is like this, you know, unspoken casting couch thing that has happened in Hollywood. They didn't come out and directly state this, but it was kind of implied that's that's what stinky pete was getting at a little weinstein action a little there. weinstein yeah. action yep so they cut this out you can't get this anymore and disney is of course cutting this out in all the streamed versions of it too now that one i can kind of understand but i am i'm somebody who argues we should keep art as it was we should allow it to be contextual you should tell your kids this came out at a time when this was acceptable. It's a learning moment, right? And don't yeah, go change the art. If you don't see what was wrong with it, then you can't grow from it. Yeah. Learn from it. Yeah. 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 That's my argument. But there's a bunch of them. Like they even went back. I didn't include this. So they went back to a Lilo and Stitch movie where Stitch is running and hides in a washing machine. I don't remember if you remember that, but he runs and like yep. hides into a washing machine. Well, I think that's oh. the that Lilo hides in the washing Lilo, machine, I think. Lilo. They changed that yeah. in the new version. So if you try to watch it these days, they went in and reanimated it to where he's not hiding in a washing machine. He's hiding under a shelf and a pizza box flips up. So they didn't want to let little kids think that it was a fun idea to hide in washing machines because they could die. So they're going back and changing even that. Mm -hmm. They're now censoring content, even though it's not important in the world. I do think it's mm -hmm. silly that they're going right. back and changing some of this stuff. Do you think they're censoring the things preemptively, or do you think that they have been sued over all of these individual <laughs> instances? And I, so they are court mandated to fix all of these things. From what I well, understand, they're doing it on their own because they want it to be a family friendly brand. They don't want to, they don't want to get sued. They're doing it preemptively. All right. We're up to reason number eight gents. This is its own separate thing. What they did to Star Wars. All right. I don't know where you two stand on this, but I'm going to reveal my bias here. Remember those beloved Star Wars movies we grew up with, four, five, and six? You know, even the prequels are now being looked at at a fond eye, even though I didn't like them. But compared to what Disney did to them, the prequels weren't that awful. So think about what happened. I don't know if you two have seen the new ones. But back then, they at least took time between them. George Lucas had an overall plan. He would mm -hmm. took multiple he took multiple years between movies. And four, five, and six, I still love to this day. Even though there's some cheese factor in them, I think they stand up. I think they have some edge to them. It's this nice mm -hmm. balance of fun frolic and you know some criticism of of culture. There's some stuff in there. Um, mm -hmm. I've never had the urge to go back and watch the prequels, but I do go back to four, five, and six all the time. Now, this is according to Screen Rant, because I just didn't want it to be my opinion. But Screen Rant says, if you look at what Disney did, did after they buy Fox, they rush out the next trilogy. The next trilogy, because they need to make up their money, and they need to make bank. They rushed it. They hired different directors, different writers for a trilogy. That alone should kind of 
spark your mind and go, what are they doing? Did you know that they didn't even have the scripts written or all planned out before they started to make them? So while seven was being shot, the guy who wrote eight just had a couple of plot points as to what was going on in seven. And he was forced to start to work on eight before they had the story done of seven. Now, as a writer, that's, that's a, that's an awful mistake. You never do that. You always flesh things out because if I'm like, if I'm working on the plot of nine and I come up with a really good idea that makes, I don't know, Luke develop as a character and I go, Oh, I, I have to go back to seven and add something like that sets that up. You can't do that anymore. It's done. Are, weren't like one through nine already in existence before the first movies came out. I don't know the whole history, but yeah, the, the- Lucas had a plan for everything he says. Now, right. when the, they were the screen on, version is always different from the book yes. version anyways, but yeah. yeah, he said he had a plan. Now, I don't know how fleshed out those plans were when they did make four, they, 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 the studio wasn't thinking that there could be a sequel. You know, it wasn't titled four at first. So you could argue that, yes, this is how the franchise started off, but mm-hmm. Lucas did have a good plan for four five and six, at least when he started off, like there was an arc that made sense. Mm -hmm. Um, but they took multiple years between them. Disney rushed these out or they were planning to every year, yearly basis. So they, they were trying to rush them out. And I don't know if you guys saw them. Um, I saw seven and I was so appalled that I only could watch like reviews and clips of eight and nine. I don't care if eight, nine got better. Seven was such an atrocity to me and what they did. I got confused watching the new ones because there were so many so quick and there were some <laughs> that weren't in the series that yes. came out as yep. well. Like yep. the solo story type of, I got confused and I didn't understand what I was watching and I did not enjoy my time. I yeah. did not finish them all. It's gotten so confusing. There are now more yeah. star Wars movies made in the last five years than there were ever star Wars movies. They've kind of flooded the market with them. And Disney even had to admit the projections on these things, even though seven did wonderful and eight and nine made them a ton of money that the reviews and kind of reaction to them was much more negative than they expected. So they (laughs) stopped releasing as much like they canceled a bunch of the side stuff they were going to make because they, in my opinion, ruined it. Screwed the pooch. Yeah. Now, because I have this weird compartmentalized brain where the prequels are separate to me from four or five and six. To me, Star Wars is only four or five and six. The prequels are this other thing, but because they were a prequel, I could ignore them. But seven, eight, and nine bring back the original actors and kill them to me in the most lame ways possible that it just, it ruins it. Like when I had four or five and six, I could treat in my mind that Han Solo and Luke and Layla, Leia, that they were all out there doing their thing. They were fighting the empire, that they had a victory and it ended on a positive note. When I now know this, they're dead and they didn't get to see their goals come to fruition and it ruins it. So I have to act like they don't exist. I have to act like these don't exist. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, Disney, I will never forgive you for that. Maybe that's what inspired this. Anyway, we're up to nine. We're up to nine. So, go ahead. So, tell us about your childhood, Matt. You know, if you <laughs> if you really want to vent, I mean, let's let's get this out of here. Also, Disney owns Deadpool. Don't you think that's funny now? Pretty hilarious. Yeah. Let's move on from something that you know doesn't really matter in the grand scheme of things to something that does. Disney mistreats its employees. There's been reports for decades. Disney might not be the happiest place on earth. It's according to Peter Dreyer at the nation since 20, 2006, the company has grown its revenue from 31 billion to 69 billion. So it almost double, double its profits over the last few years, theme parks, feature films, broadcasting. Disney has earned 14 billion in profits in one year, uh, in one year specifically 14 billion alone and gave its CEO an 80% boost in compensate compensation. So the CEO gets, at least when I look this up, about $66 million. Now that's a whole other episode or CEOs overpaid, but that's that annual compensa- compensation is about 1500 times what the median Disney worker earned. So if you factor in like the PR staff, the assistants, the people who work at the theme parks, about 1,500 times bigger than the average wage at the company. 
But that's just how much profit they have. Since the late 90s, human rights groups have been pointing out that Disney tends to hire, for some reason, people who work in sweatshops in Bangladesh, China, and Haiti. A 1996 report came out from the National Labor Committee that uncovered that Mickey Mouse and Pocahontas pajamas were being made in a factory that paid workers 12 cents an hour, even though they were being sold for about $11 in the United States. That's about five days of work. So... 12 cents an hour. I don't know about you two. I wouldn't want to do that. 2002, after Disney said they stopped it, Bangladesh is making Winnie the Pooh shirts. This one's really funny. According to the NCL study, again, people were forced to work 15-hour shifts seven days a week, not paid any overtime, even though it was required by law. They are paid 19 cents an hour. The factory was so hot that people were dying, crowded, poorly ventilated. They found bacteria in the water coolers. They were subjected to verbal and physical abuse. And uh, Disney didn't stop that either. So despite them making so much money. They worked there. Were they forced at gunpoint? I think you just, you need a job. So you go wherever you can. Mm -hmm. But they could have quit. They could have. But if you can't find another option. Your family needs to eat. You're yeah, gonna, you're going to go suffer. hungry looking for a new job. Clearly, Disney was providing them an income and was helping these people. You could argue that, Brian. You could argue that. Very, okay. very true. I have one more reason that Disney might be evil, and then we'll, I'm going to go to one counter argument. Okay. Even though I said it's not going to be <laughs> fair, but there are actually two. There are two main counter arguments. Okay. Reason 10. This one's Is smaller. Yes. Is Matt oh. lying? Was this whole episode a lie? Disney is screwing theaters right now. All right, you ready? Unlike other studios, Disney has a reputation for very strict conditions upon what theater owners must do. And I don't know if you know much about theater owners, but as a movie theater owner, you ha- can buy certain movies not the rights to the whole movie, but the right to license them to play them, like a distribution license. And most companies will take a certain cut of your ticket sales. And really, you as a movie owner or a movie theater owner make your profits from the popcorn and candy. The standard deal is about 55%. So almost all the movie companies do 55 or to 50. So I get half the money as the person who made that movie and you get half as the ticket sales. Disney does almost 70%. So Disney takes a 65 to 70% cut compared to 50 to 55. One distribution studio executive said, this is forcing mom and pop operations to close down and then helps Disney because they also own a lot of theaters. So it's an intentional screw job to push smaller businesses out of the market. Also convenient, right? You have fewer theaters. It's going to push more people to Disney Plus, right? If you live in a smaller market, you won't want to drive to a theater 40 minutes away. So you're just going to pay for Disney Plus instead. Or just I haven't been to a theater in the last five, six <laughs> years because I stream on my television and don't have to pay money to go to the theaters. So I'm actually surprised theaters are still a business in the first place. It's it's a tough, tough sale these days. Yeah, Ben. Yeah, just... Like, yeah, putting the mom and pops out of business and actually owning theaters, they're just taking out the competition in the theater biz as well. But yeah, the streaming. The internet really hates Disney. You think so? You think think the tide has turned? People have had enough? I think think I've seen enough postings throughout my time in social media that I've seen that people will do anything to attack Disney. They They love the products that Disney puts out. I see. But as uh, attacking the Disney company itself, I think is a, a commonplace trend. That is a good point you raised, Brian. Should we separate the art from the company? Because it's, it's not fair to to really attack the art, the artists, and the you know the digital media individuals that are that are creating these products. Is they are just artists in their field doing work. They just get their check signed by the Disney company. Okay, so let's move on uh, to the two best counter arguments to Disney not being evil. This this is really all of them that I read boil down to these two. All right. (laughs) Number one is, let me move here. Number one is 
It's just a business doing its business thing. That's all. It's not an evil thing. It's just doing its business thing. It's capitalism, baby. You got to make that money. You got to keep making your shareholders more money. You got to make those jobs. So if Disney wants to keep making more money, it's just doing a business thing. You can't call Disney evil because every other company does it too. That's really, that's the first argument. Just business, man. They're just more successful than others. Yep. That any business, any other business would die to be in Disney's shoes right now. They're just jealous. You're just jealous because you're not making that much. Ben doesn't look, Ben doesn't look like. (laughs) Well, the the current board of directors and company people, they're just standing on the shoulders of the success of the previous generations. But yeah. So they can try to rebrand. They can try to go, um, diverse you know oh look we're making the disney princess latino we're making uh, this whole movie about uh, this uh, you know hawaiian tribe uh look at us we're, we respect you culturally but we're screwing over third world countries while we do it which is a whole nother episode it's a whole nother matt rant of how i think companies are trying to hide up their evil ways by going politically correct like look at us we're doing this we're doing that but anyway for for those viewing one of my life goals is to be Scrooge McDuck in a giant pool of gold coins. Mm-hmm. So if you no. want to donate your gold <laughs> coins to me, I'm okay with that. You can help fund Brian's gold coin collection by either sending them directly to his post office box, will, will, which I eventually hope to put in the description, Brian. you got to get one of those so fans can send you free coins. And in the time being, please become a patron to the Comedic Matters podcast or give us crypto donations. Both are in the description. All right, guys. The Can I last, still swim in the crypto don- donations? Uh, not as fun to swim in those, but actually, if you ever saw the Family Guy episode, I think where Peter tries to dive into gold coins, you'll see what would really happen. Like, you would hit it. Yeah. Like a That's brick. a cartoon. It's a solid. It's not liquid gold. And what, what Family Guy didn't address is, think about how dirty money is. You know that's not been cleaned, right? So you not only get a wound, but it's also going to get. You don't know f- if I'm going to clean my money before You're not going to clean your money. You're going to clean every coin. Maybe, maybe I like stranger spit on my coins. Send more. All right. You heard it from Brian. Brian, if you just the spit, just the spit. <laughs> if you really do get spit, Brian, we have to make that a behind the scenes patron exclusive. Uh, okay. Brian's weekly spit collection. Let's see what he got today. All right. Here's the last one. Here's the last argument. And I'm serious. I couldn't really find any serious pros other than this one. This is according to Aaron Schnorr at Better Marketing. This is for, Disney from the 80s right here. For Disney's audience, nostalgia remains a driving force behind the avenue uh, annual revenue. Consumers who experience the power of Disney in their childhood are reminded of their innocent childhood. So Disney is providing us with an escape from the miserable adult existence and providing us warm and fuzzy feelings to escape that for Disney, there's their focus on storytelling and their mastering of storytelling and creating emotions, except star Wars it brings us back to a, a lovely time. So Disney is giving us an escape. Shouldn't that override everything else and call and make us say that Disney is not evil. That's the other argument guys. Thoughts. The fact that it promotes escapism is a reason that it's a good thing. That it gives us escape. It gives us a matrix like out to it feel warm. memories. Because I'll admit, regardless of how cynical and pessimism and jaded in my defensive wall, when I still hear that jingle, see that Walt Disney Company Corporation logo before a movie, I go, this reminds me of a more interesting time of my life. Ah. Oh. But I think I think that reminds you again of the art and not of the company. So I think that separation again is where that they separate. But look at that well, childhood. Who framed Roger Rabbit? That's a classic. You got Lady in the Tramp, Little Mermaid, Black Cauldron, Peter Man, Gra- <laughs> Peter kind Man. of a weird, Great Mouse Detective, Detective. Peter Man, Great Mouse Detective. Yeah. Uh, what else? Lady Mouse. and the Tramps. There, Tron's a good one. So those are all like I'd rewatch those. I haven't gone back and watched Disney movies. I, I just have a big backlog, but. I'd imagine that some of them stand up. Mm-hmm. However, I have to admit this warm and fuzzy feeling. I'm second guessing myself now. We have one more thing. I promised you this because this is important. Definition of evil. What's evil mean? So we, we now know some of those wicked practices. Now, are those enough to say evil? Here's what I found from the definitions. 
profound immort- immorality or wickedness, or, so that's, that's one de- definition, profound immorality or wickedness, or generally wrong behavior. And to me, that one's the more compelling one. All right. It's what's avoided by good people, like stealing, lying, or murdering, Defining evil is very complicated because it's often ambiguous. There's different interpretations of it. It could mean causing suffering. It could mean the full range of immorality, such as genocide or malicious gossip. So it it has a weird range, right? A broad concept defines evil simply as any and all pain and suffering, any bad state of affairs, wrongful action, or character flaw. So all those are definitions. As you can see, they're all across the board. Some people say it means you're committing one of the big ones like murder. Some people say it just means any bad state of affairs or wrongful action. So this one's going to come down to how to you guys interpret evil. What do you think of when you think of evil? I have a hard time with evil because most times those who are considered evil are doing good in their own point of view. So it's a really, it's a point of view type of thing so like if like a robin hood thing like like, like hitler hitler didn't think he was evil he thought he was doing good for the the future of mankind Mm -hmm. but everyone else said you're a fucking asshole yeah hitler never at one point thought genocide was evil we don't know ben so in his delusion he was being a holy warrior for justice but he was actually yeah yep yes Right. Like, you know, Thanos probably thinks he's doing the world better okay. by wiping everybody out, right? Um, you find that throughout human history. Well, I don't think Mickey would agree with Thanos' approach because then they'd get less money from... That's true. You wipe out all the characters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, but then there's less competition. This is a biggie, guys. This is a biggie. We have to decide. We now know what evil could be interpreted as. We now know 10 reasons why Disney might be evil. We now know the two major counter arguments as to why they might not be evil. So now it's time. We got three guys. We got a rule. Whatever we say is set in stone. You got to pick, is Disney evil? If you think yes, write evil. If you think no, write no or draw a flower or draw something innocent. Whatever you want. Evil or no, we'll come back with a drum roll. And we're going to tell you what we decide. Okay, folks, we are back to tell you, is Disney evil? After the drum roll, reveal your answer, guys. Here we go. Is Disney evil? Not cool. <laughs> Brian, hold on. He it wants Disney money. I couldn't possibly consider Disney an evil product. Okay. No, pay me. All right, huh? Brian is going. Yeah. Brian, I respect that. If you can get a sponsorship. Uh, this episode will not be released <laughs> if you can work that out. Um, Patreon only. Patreon only exclusive. But because of the majority, Ben and I have outruled you yet again, Brian. Disney is evil. There you have it, folks. It'll be etched into stone. It'll be written in books. The Bible will probably be updated to include this as well. Disney is evil. All right, everybody, that wraps up today's episode of Comedic Matters Podcast. I had a lot of fun while learning about the twisted ideas and practices of Disney. I think we did some great work, don't you guys? Don't you think we tapped in some internet rage? We have big plans for the Comedic Matters Podcast, and with your support, we'll be able to upgrade, expand, and make even more content, but we won't be as corrupt as Disney, I promise. Head on over to the Comedic Matters Podcast Patreon link to become a member of the Matter Mob. As a member of the Matter Mob, you'll get exclusive access to extra shows, behind-the-scenes looks, as well as other goodies. We'll see you next time, everybody. And until then, stay weird, stay wacky, and remember that seaweed is definitely going to be greener in somebody else's lake because companies as greedy as Disney are putting their toxic waste into it. Goodbye, everybody.